as you may know, intellectual property plays an important role in the national laboratory system, and especially to Argonne. So I wanted to start by thanking everyone again for coming out here uh, and welcome you all to the kickoff of IP Week. So happy IP Week, everybody. <laughs> uh, the, so today we're going to kick it off by having a few, a few speakers explain the importance of intellectual property from their perspective. And we have a total of four speakers today. So I'm gonna get this kicked off by introducing all of the speakers and then I'm going to handle it, hand it off to our first speaker, Glenn McEwen. Glenn McEwen is our general counsel of Argonne National Laboratory. He oversees the legal department, which includes a number of IP professionals, including myself and Mark Languth and Mr. Hilliard uh, and LaShondra Moore. Uh, and so I think I've caught everybody. I don't see Debbie just yet, but I'll introduce her as she comes in. Uh, I also want to, we also, so Glenn is going to talk today about what is intellectual property. He will also explain a little bit of how intellectual property relates to our prime contract, the contract that governs the relationship between Argonne and the U.S. Department of Energy. After that, Ushma Kriplani, the Interim Associate Laboratory Director for Science and Technology Partnerships and Outreach, STPO for short, will explain the importance of IP to our laboratory, to its missions and its programs. After that, we're going to have Supratik Guha, professor of the Pritzker School for Molecular Engineering and director for NST, come and discuss the importance of IP from a researcher's perspective. And he's really going to explain how has IP helped him and his career, not just at Argonne, but also in industry. So you're going to get to see both sides of that. And finally, we have as our keynote speaker, Brian Lally, Associate General Counsel for Technology Transfer and Intellectual Property. Brian joins us here from DOE headquarters today uh, to explain the importance of IP to the US Department of Energy. And he will, I'm not gonna steal any of his thunder, but he's going to explain how even in this administration there is an increased emphasis on intellectual property and technology transfer to show the return on investment for taxpayer dollars. So again, thank you. Please do help yourself to all that pizza. I was serious. We do need to make sure that's gone by the end of the hour. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Glenn McEwen to start off our IP week. Thank you again, everyone, for coming out. I think I have. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Pete said, um, my name is Glenn McEwen, and I'm general counsel at Oregon National Laboratory. Um, the Technology Commercialization and Partnership Division, or TCP, and the Argonne Legal Department are hosting this week's Intellectual Property Symposium. I want to offer my sincere thanks for, take, for you taking the time out to uh, your busy schedules to attend today's program. And I hope the other symposium events that are scheduled for this week. The management and operating contract with the U.S. Department of Energy that defines, defines the mission and the goals of Argonne National Laboratory, uh, which includes the dissemination of the fruits of our research endeavors at the lab. Um, in the statement of work for this prime contract that really governs the, all the operations here at the lab, um, it defines what DOE's expectations are. And um, one of the goals that the statement of work um, reflects is the transfer of knowledge and technological innovations and to foster productive relationships among laboratory research programs, universities, and industry in order to promote national economic competitiveness. The laboratory's mission of disseminating knowledge and technology is reinforced throughout the prime contract. In this particular clause, um, clause I-113, technology transfer is identified as a mission of the laboratory. In order to fulfill this technology transfer mission, Argonne is charged with the stewardship of the intellectual property that is developed at the laboratory. The lab is also responsible for establishing internal capabilities and utilizing mechanisms authorized by DOE to identify and push the intellectual property out to partners in academia, industry, and government for further development and use. So what do we mean when we talk about intellectual property? Whoops. There are three principal types of intellectual property that are handled at Argonne. There are patents, copyrights, and trademarks. 
And when we talk about intellectual property, they are assets that are derived from human intellect, such as inventions, discoveries, and expressions of ideas that are protectable under law. Now, the first two, patents and copyrights, are the ones that we'll be focusing on mainly during the course of the IP symposium. But I wanted to give kind of a, just a very basic description of these forms of intellectual property. Um, much more detailed explanations of patents and copyrights will be offered by individuals during the course of the symposium with far more expertise and experience than I in the area of intellectual property. So patents. Patents. It's, having a patent is a grant by the government of an exclusive property right to an invention for a specific period of time. The owner of the patent has the right to exclude others from using, making, or selling the invention for the life of the patent. Copyright is a legal protection of an expression of an original idea that has been reduced to a tangible form. So copyright applies to such things as written works, visual and sound recordings, works of performing arts, and of what's of particular concern here at the laboratory, mainly is software. The copyright owner has exclusive right to use, distribute, reproduce, and create works, new works from the original creative work. Trademarks can be a name, symbol, design, or a combination thereof that identifies and distinguishes a product or service in the marketplace. A trademark can be a company name, a product name, or a logo. And the owner of a trademark can exclude others from using a similar mark or goods if such use is likely to cause confusion to the public about the source of the goods or services. Now, the, the capabilities that exist within TCP and the law department are here to assist the laboratory and its researchers in fulfilling this tech transfer mission and the stewardship of intellectual property. In the legal department, we have three attorneys and two paralegals who work are largely devoted to this mission. Um, the members of the IP team have over 85 years of combined intellectual property and tech transfer experience, with about 50 of those years of experience right here at Argonne. Two of the legal department's intellectual properties attorneys, Mark Hilliard and Pete Sloniak, will be presenters during this week's IP symposium. So in conclusion, I, I hope you find the events of this year's symposium instructive. I hope you come away with a greater understanding of the laboratory's processes for protecting and developing intellectual property and an appreciation of the opportunities that exist with outside research collaborations. I will hand the floor over to Ushma Kriprani, who oversees the other co-sponsor of Thank this program. Thank you all program. for coming. Thanks again. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit from where Glenn left off and talk a little bit about impact and what IP has to do with it. Uh, Argonne is a multi-program lab, as you all know. Uh, we do work in an awful lot of areas of science and technology. And in many of those areas of science, we go from really basic discovery science all the way to quite applied work. So when we think about making impact with this portfolio of work that stretches from basic to applied and that stretches across different scientific areas, we need to be somewhat uh, careful and uh, tailor our approach to what is needed by the technology, by the science program, by potential sponsors, whether they be DOE or somebody else. Uh, IP, I'm going to tell you, is a very useful tool to help across the spectrum. And surprisingly, it works at the basic end as well as further up the TRL chain. So I have here some thoughts about how IP can help you get to where you want to be to make an impact with your work. Uh, the first one is that when we have a, an IP portfolio in an area, it demonstrates that the lab has a deep capability in that space. Uh, an example that we think of naturally at Argonne is energy storage. Energy storage at Argonne was funded first by BES up on the very basic front for many years. And uh, we developed uh, an IP portfolio from that work, and that attracted future funding from EERE. It attracted many industry sponsors to our work, and and uh, all of this is basically history. We've been at Argonne for a while. Everybody knows of our legendary battery portfolio, our work with industry, and our work with many parts of DOE, but also other agencies outside of DOE. And uh, so that's, that's kind of something that we would like to have happen in other areas as well as we go on. Uh, a completely, uh, well, not a completely different thing, but a somewhat different thing that you can do with IP is, uh, is the second piece here. 
it turns out to be kind of a requirement or an essential precursor for many kinds of funding that will help you further the maturation of your technology uh, after the original program has stopped funding it. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about internal funding that you can have for this purpose, but also DOE funding that you can have for this purpose. Um, the third point there is something that uh, Argon doesn't think about a lot. Uh, we are not, uh, unlike perhaps many universities, we are not filled with people who want to rush out and start startups. But nonetheless, IP helps you think about entrepreneurship as a mode of making impact. And I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. Uh, the fourth one down is, if you like, completely different than the first one. The first one I said, it, it's a signal of the fact that we have a significant broad-based uh, science and technology portfolio in that area. But IP can also be used as a signal for our emerging science and technology areas. It's a footprint that we can uh, put down, we can plant a flag and say, okay, this is something that we care about, this is something that Argonne is going to be investing in. And so potential partners look at us as, uh, as somebody you want to work with because it's an area of growing focus for us. So while we might not have such a, such a uh, great uh, footprint in, say, quantum or microelectronics, we bring, if you like, the sunk weight, the huge uh, weight that is Argonne National Lab to that field, and we are putting resources into it. And look, we have both publications and conference proceedings, but also we have IP. And then finally, and you know, it's on the bottom because everybody knows about it, it's royalty funds. Royalty funds are the best kind of money because it's completely colorless in lab lingo. Um, not only is it beneficial to the, to the inventors of the, of the IP, but it's also hugely beneficial to the lab because that royalty money that comes back to the lab can be used to drive new programs for which there's no other funding. It can be used to create these new priority areas that drive our future and keep us at the forefront of science and technology. So uh, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into some of these. And then I think as Glenn mentioned, the rest of the week has uh, deep dive sessions into examples and topics that are going to cover basically all of them. And uh, Pete and uh, uh, TCP have structured this, uh, this agenda so that uh, various pieces are going to appeal to different ones of you, and I hope you're going to try and make as many of them as you can. Uh, I'm going to step back for a second and give you a little bit of context. Um, how do we do uh, on, this, uh, on this one metric? So at Argon, we file about 150 invention disclosures a year. It has a little bit of a, of a spread to it, somewhere between 130 and 160 or something. But 150 is, uh, is not a bad average for the last uh, few years. Uh, typically, we file about 60 or 70 patents. And every year, we are issued about 50 patents. So um, that's a little bit of a lagging measure. Uh, the patents issued in a given year are not typically those that are filed in that year. It takes somewhere between 18 months to three years to have a patent issue. But nonetheless, I think uh, that, that gives you the message of where we are. Uh, we also have typically 30 or so commercial copyright associations every year and many, many more open source uh, copyright associations. If you look at uh, this, uh, the, the picture on the right-hand side, it puts us in context uh, with the other labs, in the, with many of the other labs in the complex. And uh, what you see here is that we're really outperforming in the complex based on our size or based on our relative size to the other labs. And the fact that all of the labs uh, that are further up, uh, that are on the left-hand side of Argon on that chart, are all labs that are A, significantly bigger in size. Sandia is pushing three times uh, our size at $3 billion. And all of them have very applied science portfolios, which is the kind of area that you would naturally find lending itself to IP creation. So among the labs that have a significant science portfolio, such as Argon, we're really doing very well, I think. So moving on into my promised deep dives, uh, if you remember, I said that IP is a method to allow you to gain funding to further mature your science and technology. Um, I'm going to talk about two examples, and the very first one is DOE-funded commercialization programs. Uh, the example here of note, uh, because it's very well funded, but also because Argonne routinely does, routinely, for the last three or four years we've done very well in it, um, you know, so that's become routine now, uh, is the Technology Commercialization Fund. The TCF is uh, a source of money that's drawn by taxing various programs um, in DOE, and it's returned as a a uh, set of uh, proposals or set of uh, funding allocations to PIs who want to try and mature their technology further 
in a more applied direction. Uh, in this year, in FY20, OTT will be dispersing something between 24 and $26 million in a series of proposals. They come in typically two types, type one, which is smaller, and type two, which is larger. Uh, starting in FY20, both the caps on type one and type two have gone up a lot, so now these are significant. Uh, they were nothing to sneeze at before, and now they are very significant funding pools that, that are available. Uh, so for type two especially, you need to have uh, a patent application that's been filed or a patent uh, that's been issued or a copyright to try and take advantage of this, uh, of this program. Uh, I mentioned that uh, we do well. It's been a focus area for us for the last few years, and you'll see our statistics on the right-hand side. Uh, we make an effort to submit a good number of high-quality proposals, and we have seen that uh, come back in terms of uh, good results. Uh, I would encourage everybody who has, um, who has uh, an area of work that is applicable to the TCF to check it out and turn in a concept paper. The deadline for concept papers is this week, but it's not a lot of work to turn in a concept paper. And once that's done, you have a little more time to figure out uh, all of the other requirements of the TCF. Uh, TCP is always here to help you, so if you go to Inside Argon and look for TCF or Technology Commercialization Fund, it will guide you to an Inside Argon article with all the information you could possibly want. So please, uh, please check it out and then get back to us. Uh, that was DOE funding, a completely different mechanism of trying to develop technology beyond the point that BES paid for it, say, is a lab to market program. This is a new program that we have kicked off this year. It started in June, in fact, and uh, it's our internal tech maturation program. We are providing internal argon money through a competitive process to those technologies that we feel could be matured a little bit further. So we believe that we have a lot of patents that are not quite ready for commercial utilization by a partner. But what they need is some small proof of concept some scale up in volume of, of material manufactured, some demonstration to in fact be of interest to a commercial partner. And the idea behind L2M is to try and identify those, those uh, patents and award them money so the scientist, you guys, can spend a year working on that proof point, pushing the, the technology where it needs to go. And simultaneously, you'll be working in close partnership with one of the business development folks in TCP who are going to be helping develop the market for this technology that you're maturing. So as you come to the end of 12 months or 15, it's our first year, we're a little bit flexible on timing, you're going to find that uh, you have a client or, or hopefully many clients who are interested in what you've done with that technology and hopefully we'll be able to license it to them and thus take that out into industry and make an impact uh, with it. Uh, I said it was rolled out earlier this month, uh, earlier this year, sorry, in the summer. Uh, we had a very good response on our first round, and uh, these pre-proposals have been now through several stages of screening and judging. And uh, we are very, very close to announcing results for the ones who will be funded in FY20. In fact, I hope that um, this week we'll be able to announce those, uh, those results. And it'll be either two or three projects that are funded to do this piece of tech mat alongside a BDE who will build out the market with you and help license it at the end of this process. Uh, so, I said license, well, everybody knows that uh, Argon, and in fact, all of the national labs, for that matter, all science doing inst uh, institutions, so universities as well, uh, seek to license their IP when they get it. And we are no different, in fact, I would say that, um, like with the other metric I showed you, we, we hold our own in this uh, space as well, in, in the complex. Uh, but an area of problem are small companies or startups. Uh, these people, companies typically don't have kind of internal resources to be able to engage with a national lab and go through an extensive contracting process and, and get to an outcome. Uh, at the same time, they're a very important segment of our US economy in terms of, of the commercial space. Uh, there's an awful lot of money, private funds, venture capital funds, going into small companies, especially in the hard tech areas. And so, we would like to work better with them and do more with them and, and help that sector. And so uh, what we've done also starting in FY20, it was just rolled out uh, earlier in September, is we have uh, defined and, and created a streamlined process, a set of generic terms by which companies can work with us on specific pieces of IP. And what this gives them is a finite term 
access to that, to that uh, IP. They have nine months to go away and work with it and decide if they understand what the market is, they can go ahead and work through their hypotheses for what their customer looks like, what their customer needs. And if they're happy with the answers, they can come back to us and then license that IP on favorable terms, pretty much as we do with all of our startup partners. But uh, the idea here is to make the barrier up front very low so that we can get more IP into the hands of, of qualified startups and small companies. So that's IP. I'm going to switch gears a little bit away from licensing to entrepreneurship. Now, I said that uh, you know, the national labs are not uh, a bastion of, of uh, spin-outs. And uh, that's true, of course. And that's you know, what makes our people happy makes us happy. And uh, that's good. But we do see that uh, there's a change in our demographic and kind of matching the national zeitgeist in this, there is more of an interest in looking at small companies as a means of making impact with your technology. So um, in this general entrepreneurship bucket, there are several different things that one can do if one has a patent or uh, a copyright. A patent or a copyright in combination with, with specific other tool sets can help you uh, define what a business idea might look like. It can help you uh, take that hypothesis and test it with your customers and refine it so that it actually does make sense for the customers that, that would potentially take it from you. And uh, you can also then use that, that thinking, that framework, to figure out who else might want to fund you or who might want to fund you to take that technology further. And that brings us back to the earlier examples that I had. So uh, the Energy i -Core program is DOE's version of customer discovery. It's based on the NSF i -Core program, which has been used now for a while. And the idea is that um, lab scientists, a small group, typically three, will identify a piece of IP that they've been working on and then spend a couple of months in a given year uh, to go ahead and call 80 or 100 customers and try and understand who cares and specifically why do they care. And with that knowledge, they can then look at other avenues for funding or it can be licensed to one of those customers that we reached out to as part of the R&D process. And by R&D, I mean R&D for the market, not R&D for, for the technology. Um, or something else can be done. Um, kind of, uh, I have three examples on here, if you like. Uh, the next example is, is this one here called Skystrata. Uh, Skystrata is actually um, one of those unusual beasts. It's an argon spin-out. Uh, the technology, well, it's an argon uh, spin-out, but without the people. So it's, it is an unusual beast, but not that unusual. Um, so um, it's IP that was generated in cells. It's a cloud computing platform that uses machine learning to try and decide which cloud platform a customer should be using based on metrics such as uh, pricing and availability and energy footprint and, and several other things. So the idea is that uh, if you utilize the technology there, you can be a small or medium-sized business and you don't need to keep on staff a whole bunch of DevOps people. You can utilize Skystrata as your platform to switch between cloud providers and get sort of the same kind of work that you'd get done if you had one or two DevOps sitting around doing this for you manually and, and looking at it uh, uh, on some regular cadence. Uh, so uh, what was cool about this is that once we had the IP, we actually secured uh, interest from a VC firm called IP Group. And uh, they helped develop the technology in-house. And uh, they were really pleased with, with what our scientists could do with it. And uh, we are now at the stage where we expect that IP Group is going to create a company. That's Skystrata is going to be the name of the company, in fact. And uh, they're going to commercialize this technology through a startup. Um, it turns out that the people who worked on the technology are quite interested in, in doing some work with the startup. So it was an opportunity for us, for legal and TCP, to work together again and help them understand under what terms they can continue to work at the lab and also work for the company. And uh, this is something we don't do a lot of, but we're keen on, on helping our PIs get the most out of their lives here. And if there's more than one thing you'd like to try, come see us and we can try and figure out what that sandbox is, which is Argonne's work, what is your own personal work, and where the line is drawn. And um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the very last box because I think Everybody must know about Chain Reaction Innovations. It's a DOE-funded entrepreneurship node. We are one of three labs to have one. Oak Ridge and Berkeley are the other two. Uh, and unlike in Skystrata, where 
the scientists who work on the technology continue being argon scientists. They just spend a little bit of time in carefully circumscribed way with the other company. Uh, with chain reaction innovations, if you're at that time in your life that you want to leave the lab and try starting your own company, you should apply to chain reaction innovations because it's a very good program to help you incubate a very small company with a very hard, and by hard I mean difficult to mature technology. That's the kind of thing that we do really well. We, we develop hard stuff and chain reactions and the other two leap nodes are uh, engineered to make that hard stuff go further along its develop, developmental cycle. So it's very different in that regard than you know, Y Combinator or in Chicago 1871 or Matter, all of which deal much more with software and much less resource intensive work. So chain reaction is, uh, is getting a lot of interest. The other, cohort, the other two nodes are as well, and we hope to see uh, a good future with it. So my last uh, example is, is taking a step away from applied work and really thinking about uh, areas where it's basic science, but also it's basic science where we perhaps haven't done a lot of work so far. The examples I have on there are quantum information sciences and AI. Uh, both of these areas are you know, big in our landscape right now, especially AI. They're both disruptive technologies. And uh, basically, the bulk of the investment in AI and quantum has not been in academia. It has been in industry. It has been in some foreign national labs, such as the European Union. But in the US context, most of the, the investment, most of the advances that have been made have been in industry. And so as DOE starts placing a focus on these technology areas, and as we expect there to be um, RFIs coming out of BES, for example, on these areas, in fact, for quantum there already is, we need to ask ourselves, what makes us successful? What makes us look bigger than we are? And the answer to that is, partnerships with the right set of industry players who are big in this field. That's how we differentiate ourselves from our sister labs. Who has the best industry partnerships in quantum or AI? How do we get those good industry partnerships? Well, we signal to them that we're taking this seriously, that we have IP in this space. They do read our papers, but IP is what talks to them. And so if we can start an IP portfolio in these areas which are emerging for us, it differentiates us, but it also signals to our potential partners that we are the ones to pick among the national lab complex. And this is something that we're thinking about, we're working on for quantum, and I expect we will be doing so as well for the other areas. Um, you know, I see Supratik is here. Microelectronics is one of these areas. Polymer upcycling is another one. He's been spearheading the lab's efforts in those, in those areas. They also fall into this general bucket of perhaps we aren't the biggest thing in the world in those areas, but we, were, we are going to be much bigger than we are and IP is one way to, to show the world that we mean to do that. That's what I have. Um, Questions? Thanks for uh, inviting me today uh, to, to give this brief presentation. Um, so what I'd like to, I'm Supratik Guha, what I'd like to talk to you about is, uh, you know, IP and uh, IP's role in, uh, from a scientist's point of view in, in a research organization, in this case a national lab. And I'll tell you a little bit about my own experiences in dealing with IP uh, and some of my own thoughts about it. So, um, you know, fundamentally, my view is that, you know, science in the end of the day should be for the public good. Um, a lot of us here publish scientific papers, and uh, that's fine, that's great. Uh, but I think there's an added dimension to it in terms of actually having some of this work uh, turn essentially into things that people can value and buy and pay money for. Um, and there's a certain utility in that. There's a certain satisfaction in that that you know, I've found. Uh, and I think that should be the role of all scientists and engineers. And really, there's no, not that much of a difference between science and engineering. You know, good scientists or good engineers don't ever think about it that way. Um, and you know, IP is a good way of deploying this. IP in many ways, I see it as a sort of a currency for converting science to technology. Um, and so I think it's very important to 
have a very strong IP portfolio in any research organization and a mechanism, et cetera, to do this. Thirdly, you know, if money is important to you, then uh, it's also a good way, especially in the national labs and the universities. Um, I spent many years in the industrial lab, and uh, uh, you don't make a lot of money because the entire assignment goes to the company you work for. Uh, so I actually see this as a huge advantage for Argonne scientists that, you know, I think it's like 25% of the royalties goes, 34%. So, you know, this, this is not a bad deal, you know, and, and, and you ask any industrial R&D guy uh, or, or woman, uh, they would say that this is a great thing. If I were at IBM, got 34% of the royalties, uh, maybe I wouldn't be here, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it, it can be profitable. And then let me, what I'd like to do is sort of, you know, I've dealt with IP for many years, and I just want to sort of informally share a few thoughts. So I, um, I finished my PhD in 1991, and I've been in industrial labs till 2015. I <coughs> was a postdoc at IBM. Then I went to 3M, and uh, many of you might know that 3M is really a strong sort of IP-driven company. They focus on patents. Um, I kind of learned there, you know, they, they, they have the strong culture of, uh, of patenting, things like that. And, uh, and then when I came to IBM, this, I returned to IBM in 1995, and that, that training in 3M helped me quite a bit. And then at IBM, I was a, a scientist, then I was a manager, then I was a director. Um, I spent... Uh, a lot of time patenting. I have, you know, over a hundred patents, uh, uh, and uh, I also in the final six or seven years, I spent a lot of time in IBM, doing, you know, business deals as the technical person, and so I was involved in a lot of what we call joint development agreements, and I saw how, you know, patents are valued, patents are traded, you know, patents are used in negotiations, and. I developed a huge respect for this whole IP process. Okay. So a few things, right? It's, uh, you know, this, this cartoon kind of sums it up. I know it was your idea, but it was my idea to use, use your idea and to kind of, you know, IP is the sort of thing that helps you negotiate through discussions such as this, essentially, in real life. Um, I learned early on, use a technical notebook to note inventions. It's like real important. At 3M, we used to have notebooks. They were dated, they were paged, we were given instructions. I don't think you have to go that crazy over here, but it'd be good if you did. Um, and then we would, we would have to have, if you have some kind of an invention, you get it, um, uh, get it you know, witnessed by somebody and dated. And I've seen that these kinds of documents can be very helpful during litigation later on. There was a famous um, litigation case between 3M and Johnson & Johnson about some kind of cast or bandage that Johnson & Johnson was selling. 3M claimed they've developed it. And basically, there's a huge settlement that boiled down to a guy having taken extremely careful um, you know, technical notebook entries that were all witnessed, so it was like an you know, iron tight ironclad case. Um, there's a big change that happened in 2011. Prior to that, you know, um, noting all this was even more important in 2011. I believe the first to file law went as opposed to first to invent. In the past, it used to be that, you know, if you invented something, you wrote it down in your technical notebook, had it all, you know, witnessed and all, that would be good. Now they're saying that you have to be the first to file a patent, and that's what holds in a court of law if things come down to litigation, etc. And that means that, you know, we should file patents quickly. And uh, actually, my experience with the Argonne process has been that things are actually very smooth and very quick, right? Patents take time. That is just the way it is, okay? That's just the process. But even, and I've seen this happen in many places. This place, it happens pretty fast, so pretty happy about that. Um, point number two, never be presumptuous and undervalue your work. Uh, I'll give you an example from my own case. In the uh, late 1990s, uh, 
I had, um, I was looking, the half of this transistor is gone for some reason in the schematic, so you'll just kind of have to imagine. But basically, I was working on new materials for transistors, which is on silicon. You have a little, you know, this is a semiconductor. You have this little material called a dielectric, and I was, you know, we did found some results. We kind of published it, um, and then in 2003, something about those results struck us that could be used to build a new type of transistor. And uh, you know, we kind of we patented it. It was patentable. We did a few patents, uh, but you know, none of this this stuff was all pretty hazy. And you know, I thought this was like. A, yeah, fine, we're just patenting it, this is what they want to do, let's just do it. Uh, didn't take it that seriously, okay? And, but then very quickly it was very, found to be really useful. And then around 2008, 2009, IBM actually came up with a product that used these materials. So this is now, you know, you'll find these materials in your cell phones, about half of them have them most high-end computers, et cetera. And it's you know, something I, I thought was like, like a big game at that time, right? But it actually turned into something real. Um, and once something turns into something real, then people start arguing about whose idea was it, who owns it, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting I'm giving this talk today. Uh, I just learned recently that that two of these patents, there was a set of four or five of these patents that I talked about where I was an inventor. Two of them are part of a big um, lawsuit that Global Foundries has filed against 21 companies, includes Apple, Broadcom, Qualcomm, Xilinx. It's just a huge list. It's, this will probably get pretty ugly. And then this morning, some attorney called me, so I, I kind of don't know what to do myself. I've been asking Peter Sloniak. Um, yeah. But you know, this sort of thing, so, so the point is, you know, don't, don't be presumptuous. Don't say, well, maybe there's like stupid stuff anyway. Let me just publish this. Think about it a little bit. You never know, you know how things are going to be, how the water's going to go, and what's going to emerge out of it. Um, IP can provide value to their inventors in many different ways, and I want to give you a few examples of scientists, and these are people you know, whom I've known pretty well, and whose examples have, kind of, you know, have, 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 uh, have been highlighted, for, to me at least. There's a guy called Ted Mostakis. Um, he was a crystal growth guy. Yeah, well, he's retired now. He's still there. I mean, he's alive. Uh, He's at Boston University. And in the 1990s, he, uh, he patented four patents on the way to grow the semiconductor called gallium nitride on a substrate of sapphire. And then he you know, kind of went on with his life and published and things like that. And, and then late uh, mid-90s, late 90s, products started coming out. And this technology essentially is the technology that gives you solid state lighting. Right? Today you go to Home Depot, you buy these things, they have gallium nitride based structures on them. So it's a huge, it's changed the way we do lighting today. And uh, then sometime in the 2000s, Mustakis and his company, they kind of awoke and they, uh, they, they went, you know, they, their lawyers went and approached all these 40 companies saying you guys are violating some key patents this guy had discovered. They were not the key patents for this LED technology or light emitting dye technology, but they were an important part. Important enough that Boston University made a lot of money. So I spoke to Mostakis one time. He said, you know, when Boston University made a lot of money, uh, they gave me a nice certificate and bought me a nice chair. Like, you know, they, they, they have these Windsor chairs that universities make with very nice polish, and it's like a French polished thing, like Boston University written. And Mustakis is a, he's an older guy, right? People didn't worry about all this at that time. So he enjoyed that chair for like seven or eight months, and he sat on it. And then one day, somebody told him that they're taking you for a ride. So he went back to the university, and this time he was a little more insistent. 
And then the university gave him a lot of money and they named his whole lab into a center, et cetera, et cetera. So he was very, very happy, both professionally as well as financially. A second example is Professor Gertrude Neumark, whom I used to know when I was a young man uh, in the early 90s. We used to work in the same field. She, was, uh, she used to be at Phillips Research uh, and, and then uh, probably Heyman's colleague at some point. Uh, and then she uh, moved to Columbia University as a professor. Uh, she was amazing. Uh, she had a couple of semiconductor patents. Again, it goes back to the same solid state lighting field. And um, she sued you know, a bunch of big companies like Sony, Nokia, and Hitachi. And um, in the end, I think they settled for $27 million. She did not need the money. She was a Rothschild, so as you can make out, it's probably peanuts for her. But for her, it was very important. She says that I just want recognition for the work that I did, and I want to show that women can do science, she told Nature Photonics. And in the end, she passed away in 2010, and I believe she left a huge portion of that money to, to fund uh, you know, women faculty in, at Columbia. So different people do this for different reasons, and I wanted to give you a couple of examples. Then, can one balance science and engineering? And I think publications and patents can coexist, and there are many, many such examples, people having successful careers at both. Um, I will give you one example, and this is a guy that, that I'm really inspired by. He used to be on my thesis committee at USC, and I've known him for close to 40 years. His name is Stephen Forrest. He's at the University of Michigan. As a scientist, he's spectacular. He has an H index of 165. Right? He has about 141,000 citations. Um, this, is, this is really sort of the rarefied space of uh, you know, academic uh, accomplishment. Uh, a very well-known member of the National Academy of Engineering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, he's, just as an example, he published a Journal of Applied Physics paper uh, with, that's been cited about 3,700 times, right? But at the same time, he's got over 400 patents. And his patents, he has many companies, founded many companies, and one of them owns a lot of the key patents of the OLED display business. OLED, you guys must have seen OLED TVs and you know, displays. And this company now has a 7.7 .7 billion market cap. This, you know, Steve Forrest is one of, the, one of the people who's been incredibly successful at both. And there are many examples, like I said, of people who can do both. And, and this is what I think, you know, Argonne scientists, there's, there's, there's room for this over here, right? We have a really good sort of patenting engine. We've got the resources. We've got the science. And uh, you know, this is like a no-brainer to me. Uh, companies, why should a national lab do uh, research? You know, companies and national labs have different reasons for creating IP. Uh, for companies, you know, many times key patents drive profit. You know, the company Qualcomm it makes more money out of, it, of, out of its patent royalties, more profit than profit from selling its chips. Um, and because it owns a whole bunch of patents uh, that, that, that form the basis of CDMA technology to start with. UDC was another example. Sometimes companies like to own large patent portfolios. It helps them big patent buckets, helps them leverage and negotiate. You may have known that in July, Apple you know, spent $1 billion to buy Intel's uh, 5G modem business. It came with 2,200 employees and you know, close to like 17,000 patents. Um, one way to look at it is so Apple buys its chips, uh, I believe, from Qualcomm. So it gives them now leverage in negotiations with Qualcomm. Uh, it also allows them possibly to be able to build their own modems. Uh, but basically, a big reason they've spent a billion dollars is for this sort of 17,000 patent bucket. Well, why should a national lab get into patents? You know, we're not in the business of, sort of making money in that sense. 
Uh, but think about a lab, right? I mean, our job is also to do jobs creation, right? Why can't the national labs be sort of nuclei around which technology ecosystems grow, right? Why can't the national labs be like Stanford or North Carolina State or now the fastest growing uh, university in terms of, you know, IP and business development today is Utah, right? Why can't we be like them? Right? Think of a national lab, right? Argonne, our budget is a billion dollars, right? It's a billion dollars of money coming in. And we publish papers. We have a science presence. That is good. And we have users from the world over who use our world-class facilities. But could we not do more and use all of this stuff that we have, you know, from physics to chemistry to vacuum technology, analytics, et cetera, and create startups here, you know, create a business ecosystem. And there's a lot of interest in this today from the DOE perspective. You know, the X Labs meetings that just took place that Megan, uh, you know, ran. That was part of the purpose, and the execs in DOE who are running DOE today come from industry, and this is very much in their focus, right? And I do think this could be a future for the Department of Energy Labs, and I think we, we could all play a role in this as scientists. In the end of the day, it's the scientists' inventions that create all of this thing, right? And it's within our reach. So I think that's an essential reason why the national labs should be involved in intellectual property. And then I want to conclude with the last slide that, look, you've got to have fun in the end of the day. And if you're not having fun, then don't do it, right? And you know, that cartoon, I thought, kind of expresses that sentiment well. So with that, I end my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. So uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Brian Lally. I'm the Assistant General Counsel for Technology Transfer and Intellectual Property at DOE Headquarters. I'm really excited to be here today, um, not just because I'm an IP attorney and we're talking about intellectual property. Of course, it's something of interest to me. Hopefully, by the time you get through this IP series, if you're participating just today or this week, um, you get a sense for why IP is important for you as an inventor, um, as someone that works at a national laboratory, as a taxpayer, um, as someone who works for DOE, or the DOE complex, um, but just as maybe as a, as a citizen at some level. Um, and the focus is going to be talking about how IP is different in the world that we live in today. Um, you know, I've been doing this for about 20 years, and of course, it's a core of what I do every day. It's a core of what the IP staff and tech transfer folks work on at our national laboratories. Um, so it's always been important. Um, but I think what the takeaway is, is because of the importance of IP in the economy, um, in 2019, and frankly, where we are on the cusp of several different disruptions of technology that are going to change the world and potentially change the world very rapidly, um, IP arguably is more important than it ever has been. Um, you know, last week I was at the Innovation X Lab event um, downtown on AI, and it was a tremendous event. You know, had people from around the world um, talking about artificial intelligence and the potential it holds. Right, to change everything we do, whether it's discovering new drugs or how we plan cities, um, how we do science. Right? Um, it is the one area that it would probably touch every single piece of science and technology and engineering at our national laboratories. Right? It cross-cuts everything. Um, that's why you see such a focus on it at the department. That's why the you know, secretary just stood up a new AI office. Um, that's why there's an Innovation X Lab event on AI because of the potential it has um, to really disrupt everything we do in how we do discovery science to applied science um, to just living every day. Um, and when, you're, when we were there, you know, we heard a lot of great speakers. You know, Secretary Perry um, gave the keynote, and you know, he was focusing and saying, hey, you know, how great our national laboratories are. And he likes to talk about the department as being the department of everything. And I think that's right in a lot of ways, in that whether it's Argonne or Oak Ridge or Sandia, the breadth of technology our national laboratories and what you guys are working on is incredible. Um, in many ways, the scientists and researchers in the national laboratories are really the best of DOE 
It is where things get done. It's where the special sauce is that makes the department unique, makes the complex of our national laboratories unique. Um, and ultimately, you know, science drives everything. The science and engineering that occurs at these national laboratories are the mission. Um, but I think as was hit upon by some of the previous speakers, that mission can be you know, um, built upon and made stronger if it ends up having impact in the real world. You know? And um, you know, Secretary Perry is talking about changing the world. And if you didn't know the history of the department, you might think that's kind of an ambitious statement that you know, just a few national laboratories have the ability to change the world. Um, but that is our history at the DOE complex. Um, and perhaps no place is that a better example than at Argonne, um, our first national laboratory, where you know, whether it was that first chain reaction just a few miles from here that really brought on the dawn of the nuclear age, or as cutting edge cathode materials going in lithium ion battery technologies, or you work at APS and you work on the upgrade to make that you know, a cutting edge resource um, for the coming decades, or you do fuel reprocessing technology, or you work on AI and quantum. Um, you know, what you guys do at the National Laboratories and here at Argonne um, has the potential to change the world, and you've done it before, and there's no reason that won't happen in the future. So as we talk about, okay, if we're going to change the world, it's great to have the science that's a necessary component, right? That's a precursor to, to making an impact. Um, but transitioning that, that technology, that science, out to the marketplace and actually um, having products is a difficult journey sometimes. Um, and we've been focused um, over the last 10 and 15 years at trying to come up with innovative you know, mechanisms and programs, um, both at the Department of National Laboratories, to find ways to make that easier. Whether it's TCF that was uh, mentioned earlier, or it's reducing barriers to access for national laboratories and make it more appealing for people to um, come and work with you, whether it's making licensing agreements easier, or it's taking, you know, getting rid of some indemnification problems that you know, uh, you know, companies find scary, um, whether it's making it easier to find people, so lab partner service or things that are specific to Argonne, like access to say, hey, we can find a way to find the people and engage with people at energy storage across the complex is incredibly important. So we have to innovate not just in the areas of, of science and technology, but also kind of how we do this transition of technology um, across the complex. That being said, you know, ultimately that transition you know, really starts with intellectual property. Um, many, many times, because it's a key component if you want to collaborate with industry or you want to put together a consortia or you want to get the next innovation hub that comes out of the department. If you don't have the science, you're not gonna get it, but it also really helps to have that intellectual property um, capacity and kind of foundation. And it attracts companies, it attracts um, interest, and you know, really is, is critically important that it's done on a timely basis. You know, one of the speakers before was talking about the first to file system. You know, things are different today. The technology is moving at such a pace that if you don't, you know, get your stuff filed quickly, you might not make it to the patent office um, before someone else that's your competitor. And now trying to prove that in a court that they somehow misappropriated um, your technology from you is very, very difficult. It's a difficult journey and you're likely to lose. Um, so if you want to protect your intellectual capital, you want to protect that ability to make an impact, you know, getting things filed and talking with your folks in tech transfer and, and the, the, the legal folks is, is incredibly important. And I think the point that was made earlier that you don't have to make a decision between publication and intellectual property protection. They're not mutually exclu exclusive. You can do both. Um, you know, there's always this publish or perish mentality and there is a tech transfer um, person at, at NREL um, he had spent most of his career doing, um, doing hard science. And he kind of came up with this nice phrase, you know, don't publish or perish, you know, patent and live, right? You can do both, you know, you don't have to, I mean, of course we want folks to publish. But if you do it in a, in a careful way, you really can do both. And I think some of the examples before illustrate that you can be successful on both ends of the spectrum. That you can be successful in publication in academia and our national laboratories and also profit and spin out companies and have a commercial impact. And so that's really important to kind of take that away. You know, the whole IP value chain, you know, starts it with kind of that identification, that reporting, um, but it, it doesn't end there, right? It, it, it's make sure that the laboratory is managing the, uh, the IP properly, that it's being protected and safeguarded um, and ultimately enforced. And over the years, um, in fairness to Argonne, 
they have been doing that. You know, we've been, um, as a complex, I think, more aware not of just IP creation, but then defending intellectual property. Um, you know, I had the, the honor a couple years ago of working with the laboratory to um, support their efforts in the International Trade Commission um, case against a company that was fringing against Argonne's technology and lithium-ion batteries. Um, that's incredibly important that the, that the laboratory's licensee took that approach because if we don't defend the intellectual property and the value that we're creating, then the entire value chain falls apart. Um, and that was the reason, frankly, we stood up there and supported the lab. Not that we didn't care about the lithium-ion battery technology or we didn't want to support the, um, the laboratory. More than anything, it was to make a statement that the department is serious about this. That if we're going to fund you know, science and technology, if we're going to um, develop and pay for intellectual property protection, and we're going to license technology out there, hopefully, for impact here in the U.S. to develop U.S. manufacturing, to have ecosystems that are regional or across the country, then we have to protect that. And so that's an incredibly important component. So you can't, you know, you have to be consistent across the entire spectrum of time from identification of that IP and timely filing it all the way to enforcement and monitoring. Um, and it's not easy. And we're going to talk about today why today may be even more challenging than it was even five or ten years ago. So I talked a little bit about intellectual property, but I will, we're going to get a little bit more into the details of, of why I think it's important or why you think it should be important. Um, let's see, there we go. So this chart I use often when I speak is because it's a good visualization of the increasing importance of intellectual property or intangible assets to the, to the US economy. So if you go back to 1975, happened to be the year I was born, um, you can see that in, this is a value, um, S&P um, 500 index value by percentage tied to intangible assets. So you go to 1975, you know, a relatively small percentage, less than 20%, of the value of the S&P 500 was tied to intangible assets. You, know, you fast forward to 40 years later, and now it's a dominant player in the value of companies. If you look at um, any you know, value or you know, composite index on the stock market, and you can, that's not surprising, right? The companies that are dominant and have grown, grown rapidly over the last 20 or 30 years happen to be tech companies, IP-heavy companies, data-driven companies, companies with lots of intellectual property or copyright software. Um, and so it's not surprising that intellectual property has become really a driving force behind you know, our economy, our economic value, um, your portfolio if you, have, um, you know, if, you're, if you have 401k and then you invest in stocks, IP is going to be important to you. And it's important um, to the department because this value chain is something that we're trying to do, right? We're creating great science. But we see our national laboratories not as great just science engines, but as engines of potential economic value. Because you do great science, um, hopefully you can transition that into economic impact, job creation. And if we're going to be competitive in the 21st century, um, transitioning the technology, the great stuff you guys are doing in national laboratories out to the marketplace for impact here in the US is really critical um, to that proposition. So one point I think was made before, is certainly made several times at the Innovation X Lab event last week, is that we live on the cusp of several different disruptive technologies. I list a couple of them down here. I mean, these are somewhat obvious. Quantum and AI in particular, and that's not to underestimate energy storage, um, just have a potential to change the world, but to change the world on a, a time scale that has maybe never been seen before. And I'll give a couple examples. Um, and this is just not my thoughts, by the way. This is a thought of, of many people um, that are leading science and technology um, policy in the government and industry and academia. Um, and because of that power, intellectual property becomes in some ways more important um, because the creation of intellectual property and the rate of creation over the next 10 or 20 years is going to be astounding. You know, we were sitting around with my staff, our team last week, and we were talking about, you know, as AI starts creating inventions, a lot of interesting things come up. One, the rate of discovery, and we'll talk about that in a second, is gonna be incredible. But um, interesting things like, you know, if an AI computer system comes up with an invention, who's the inventor? Who do you put down as the inventor of a new compound when it came out of an AI simulation? It's a really interesting question. Um, if your AI system is creating 2,000 new inventions 
every month or every day, how do you keep up with that? How do you know which ones to file, which ones not to? Um, you know, last week we heard from lots of, you know, kind of titans of the AI um, effort. You know, folks like um, John Baldoni, who was the, one of the creators and, and, you know, founders of the Atom Project, which I know Argon just joined in the last two weeks. You know, I, I happen to be lucky enough to be at some of those founding meetings about three and a half, well, maybe about yeah, three and a half years ago. Um, I had just joined um, DOE headquarters, um, and my boss said, hey, I need you to go to MIT for a meeting. So I showed up, and there's a room maybe of 10 or 15 people, and I quickly realized I was um, the least intelligent person in the room. Um, it was just stock full of people from the leaders of GSK, the, national, uh, the director of uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, the director of the National Cancer Institute, and they were there to discuss how can we do a public-private partnership, do it well in the area of artificial intelligence. Because at that time, um, GSK had, had come to the conclusion that you cannot continue to do business as usual in pharmaceuticals. That a lot of the big breakthroughs have been made, and you can't take 10 years and several billion dollars to bring a drug to market and still be a viable company 20 years from now. So they came together and, and it came through a bunch of legal agreements, and interesting, they were talking very high level, and the, the GSK, there's a one attorney from the GS, um, from GSK just kind of pulled me aside and said, okay, let's figure out the legal aspects, and we went to a separate room and, and worked that out. Um, but, you know, some of the leaders for DOE that were in that meeting, you know, turned, me, turned to me at some point over dinner and said, you know, if this is successful, you know, this is probably the most important thing you ever work on, because if you can start creating value and finding therapeutics for people in months or days instead of years, um, you change the world, you change people's health, right? Um, you make it more economically um, viable for people to um, take drugs or maybe treat orphan diseases, which is not really a focus right now because it's not valuable to pharmaceuticals, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, what was interesting is, is Baldoni gave an update last week and uh, he said the paper was not published, but he talked a little bit about some of the data coming out of that program. And that in new artificial intelligence-based systems, they use that data um, to make new discoveries. And um, recently made a new discovery of a new compound never known to man that has um, real potential for a therapeutic in cancer. And he said, you know, for an average compound like that, with that much promise, it would take about five years of research at a pharma company, traditionally. Five years. They did that simulation, it took 16 hours. That is the impact that AI will have. You're going from years to hours. And so when you're starting to be able to create IP on a level that is, you know, orders of you know, um, magnitude greater than we can today, the importance of it and staying on top of it is going to be a huge challenge and it's going to be incredibly important. So, one thing that shouldn't be lost in this, and I think the GSK example of this public private partnership kind of hits home, is that you know, collaboration is going to be key. And IP is almost always going to be a key component of any joint development agreement, create a SPP hub, IP you know, uh, plan that you're coming together with industry or academia or another national laboratory, um, managing intellectual property is going to be really, really important. But the takeaway here is that you know, while we want to protect our IP, and I'm going to talk about why that's even more important today, um, given some of the, the things going around the world, um, we can't lose the fact that we can't do great science without collaboration. Um, and it's not just with other labs or US you know, institutions, oftentimes it has to be international collaboration. Um, actually, at that event last week, I, was, I, I got a chance to sit uh, and have lunch um, with the director of Fermilab, and if you know anything about it, their big project, LBNF Dune, it couldn't be more international, right? There's 180 different institutions now from around the world, dozens of different uh, countries, contributing to this huge science project. So scientific collaboration on an international scale is just, necessary for us to do great science in the 21st century. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, 
So there's, we talked a lot about the importance of IP. There's, there's good things about the, uh, the impact of the economy. Um, this is a slide from the State Department. And the first half of it, the top half, talks again about the impact intellectual property has uh, on our economy, on job creation, on the, the value creation of wage premiums over the last you know, decade or two. Um, but in the bottom, bottom half tells a little bit of a, a less um, positive story. And that is the fact that there are folks out there misappropriating technology. Um, and frankly, I, if you look from a lot of different sources, you could argue that the numbers here of, say, you know, losing, say, 100 billion um, is probably low. Um, it's likely, you know, five, six, seven, eight times that um, per year. And while it's true to say that there's always been misappropriation of IP and tech transfer and technology and over human history, um, right now there are a few state actors that are doing a, a level that has really never been seen on a strategic way that um, is concerning. And so if you start putting together the puzzle pieces of, hey, IP is really important to the economy, not just here, but the world economy, um, we sit on the cusp of several different disruptive technologies that can change the world rapidly and might create a lot of IP value. Um, the fact that you have to do international collaboration, you can't lock down our national laboratories, and there are threat actors out there that are trying to misappropriate that technology at an incredibly alarming pace. It's a very, very challenging landscape. And so, you know, how we think of intellectual property protection and safeguarding and enforcement has to be different today than it was three years ago, or certainly 30 years ago, um, and that's just reality. And if we don't change how we do this and don't do it better, it will be a detriment to the department and our mission and to the nation. So how are we addressing this? How is DOB looking to address this? Well, it's not going to be one size fits all. It's not going to be one magic bullet. Um, it's going to be a long, you know, long-term, multi-tiered you know, approach to you know, looking at balancing this need for collaboration with addressing the threat. We can't get rid of collaboration. We're not going to close down the doors of every national laboratory and every university that we fund. At the same time, you can't ignore um, if there's a threat that continues to undermine the mission that you're trying to accomplish. Um, it's going to require stakeholder engagement across the lab complex, across universities and academia, and the rest of the U.S. government, and with industry, um, and that's happening. You know, I think um, there's a sense that DOE is taking action. We talk, we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a little bit, that DOE is taking you know, action in a vacuum, and I can tell you that's not the case. There's a lot of interaction um, across the federal government on this with U.S. industry, with academia, and with our national labs. Um, and it needs to be a tiered approach. Again, one size fit all doesn't work. Um, it's only, you're gonna have to tier these protections and addressing this in a way that um, recognizes the importance of the technology, um, but also the degree of threat posed by different threat actors. And the, the reality is different actors present greater or lesser threats. And finally, is to challenge some of the traditional assumptions. There's an assumption, and I was, I was glad to hear this earlier when the other speakers spoke about, you know, don't think just um, because a technology is a low TRL, it has limited value. In fact, when, and we'll talk about this S&T matrix that the department's put together really in conjunction with the national labs, you know, the original thought process, well, maybe you should use TRL, tech readiness level, as an indicator of value or importance or risk. And it really was a lot of the CROs, the chief research uh, officers at the National Laboratory said, that's a bad assumption with these disruptive technologies. Because you could have a basic science, low TRL invention or discovery that changes the world rapidly. And if just because it's TRL level two, you might not have protected it correctly. The other point is, you know, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the threat, but as you, if you focus on TRL, and say, okay, are, are we're only going to focus on tier level three or above, or four or above, or five or above, and we're going to lock down those technologies or make them more, uh, ha offer more protections. Guess what those threat actors are going to do? They're going to go TRL level one and two. And so that's what we've seen them do, right? So they'll just go down the TRL chain and say, okay, we'll just extract value earlier. 
might be more difficult, but um, we'll do that. So um, how is D responding to this challenge? Um, before I, I talk about that, I'll, I'll just talk about my personal experience. Um, I think I was talking to Pete about this earlier. There's not a single day, not a single day, that I don't deal with one of these threats coming across my email. Um, I don't get a phone call. I don't get pulled into you know, a secured room and we are discussing some new incident or plan or threat. And not to sound alarmist, it, it, it's hard to, uh, to, to overestimate um, the, the level of threat by certain actors to misappropriate technology. Um, and it should say that some of, this, some of these efforts are legal, right? I mean, uh, some of them are not. And you know, the first one on here is the S2 policy and foreign government talent recruitment programs. For those that are not aware, those are programs, particularly by a few countries, that um, put a lot of resources behind identifying people that have access to really valuable information. Think about people at top-level universities, industry, yes, national laboratories. Um, that have really access to important cutting edge information and data and intellectual property and essentially contract with them to bring that information back to um, the host country. Um, again, could be legal or illegal means. Sometimes it's both. So that policy went out, that's out in a new DOE order. The labs are implementing it. I think it's relatively straightforward. In essence, you know, if you're a national laboratory employee or you're uh, a DOE employee, um, on some level, at some point, you're probably gonna have a choice to make. You can be part of a program like this, um, or you can be at a national laboratory as you be a federal employee. Frankly, if you're a federal employee, it's actually, it's even more concerning, um, and you might be in bigger trouble, but it's, it's, it's to try to say, um, if you play by our rules, and if you guys are fair um, actors in the world, um, we'll treat you as such, but for certain countries, if you're part of these programs, we're gonna put some restrictions on. The second policy is on international s and engagement. This came out originally in last January, and the idea is to identify these really disruptive technologies, things like AI and quantum, um, and not to lock them down entirely, but to look at, okay, what pieces of these technology areas are so important to our national interests, either economic or military, that we have to really th think about how we engage in those areas. And so over the last year, there's been an effort by the national laboratories, right? They've been front and center in creating an s and matrix in each one of these disruptive areas. And they've essentially color-coded it green, yellow, red. Green being essentially business as usual. That, um, you know, not that we're not gonna protect technologies, but it's just like you would be in any other space. Yellow being kind of a, you know, a, a higher risk category or a watch list item um, that might deserve some additional protection and red is an area that is more concerning um, and might have significant restrictions placed on it. Um, and so that is, that's in draft form. We'll probably see the release of this S&T matrix um, in the next several weeks. And the way this policy is gonna be implemented is through modification of several different orders. For, you know, the foreign engagement policy, you know, you know, orders like CRADAs and SPPs, et cetera. And essentially say, in transactions in, in those areas, in these red areas only, um, if you're an entity of country or risk, there's gonna be probably additional restrictions placed on. And it's not to say you can't do work in those areas, but you have to get an exemption. Um, it's probably important for me to put on, uh, it's not listed, and specifically not listed, um, is that there is one other order that'll eventually be affected, which is the foreign visit and assignments order um, that's been put on hold because Doing anything in that area is just more complex, I'll just say that. Um, so that's put on hold until um, we have a discussion, we're gonna have a side discussion with the laboratories um, before we do anything in that space. But these other ones will go forward and they will go forward probably um, in the next few weeks. So if you have questions about that, please come ask me afterwards. Um, and the focus right now is the national laboratories because they are the gem of what we do. But Going forward, it's very possible that these policies get rolled out into financial assistance and out to universities. So there's a lot of discussions right now in headquarters with heads of academic institutions and consortia to talk about how you would do that. 
talk to you know, entities like NSF. Again, folks, people, people think, oh, this is just DOE on its own. I can assure you it's not. Uh, in fact, NSF um, based their talent program policy um, much on DOEs. Um, we had several discussions with them. So, uh, I'll keep on going. So, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, the importance of IP and, and how you need to protect it and how it's important to the economy and how we have to balance this collaboration versus threat that we are seeing out there. Um, but, you know, one thing I heard last week was, was kind of alarming, um, and it goes to the importance of science that you guys do every day, um, and it also goes to the importance of intellectual property. And that is John Kelly, who was and is um, one of the leaders at IBM in the AI space. He was talking about the impact AI is going to have and the impact quantum is going to have, um, and potentially the, the combination of those two, two technologies. And you know, one of his conclusions was, you know, what we're going to see in those two technologies over the next 10 or 20 years is going to make what we've done in the past 40 or 50 seem insignificant. Which is hard to imagine because you know I was thinking about that today to put in context. I was like, well, 1989, you know, I think I was still using my Apple IIe, right? Um, so certainly was using I think like a push button phone, and I think we were just excited that we had like you know a, a tape recorder, message recorder on our phone, right, to take uh, to make take messages. Um, and you fast forward and see what we've done in 30 years, it's mind boggling to think what will happen in 30 years of AI and quantum are fully, fully realized. And I gave one example, one example of you know, pharmaceuticals and how that can change healthcare. Um, and I think that's maybe one of the areas of the earliest adoption. But if you start seeing how that's gonna be applied across science, across industries, the, the rapid scale of a change is likely to occur that will be just mind blowing. Um, and you know, his last point, which is kind of a scary one, was especially in the AI space and maybe even more so in quantum, is there is no second place that if you get there first, you're gonna have a huge competitive advantage for your economy, uh, for your national interests, if you're your country. And so it's not surprising that the amount of money being put into these technologies are not just in the US, but it's with you know, our competitors around the world. You know, we are in a super hyper competitive race in science and technology. And part of that is the lesson from the Cold War was you don't just you know, win by having um, a bigger military. You ultimately win because you have better science, technology, and a better and more healthy economy that allows you to um, stay competitive in the world for a long period of time. If we're not competitive in these spaces, if we don't protect our IP, if we don't transition that IP out to the marketplace to have impact in the US, we will lose that competitive edge and we could lose it at an incredibly fast pace. So I leave you that with that sobering thought. I, I really encourage you to you know, pay attention to the experts that are out here this week. Um, you know, I'm biased as an IP attorney thinking intellectual property is important. I hope you take away from all of these presentations that IP should be important to you. you know, it can be a value creator for you financially. It can help your career. Um, it certainly helps DOE mission. Um, ideally, it's going to help our regional ecosystems in the department and ultimately the country. So I appreciate your thoughts, um, your time, and um, I'll stick around for a little bit if you have any questions. And uh, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> any questions, by the way? Happy to answer any. Okay. Thank, you, every thank you, everyone, for coming out today. And thank you especially to our speakers, including Brian, who came all the way from D.C. for this. Uh, we covered a lot of territory today. We talked about what is IP, how it helps the economy, why it's important to the DOE's mission, to Argonne's mission, and hopefully, but not least, uh, we've covered why it's important to each of you as researchers. Uh, the rest of the week, we're going to dive into the nuts and bolts of what is IP, how it works at Argonne, how it can help you. Uh, so tomorrow, we're going to be covering patents. Uh, I'm sorry, Wednesday, we'll be covering software and copyright. And on Thursday, we're going to do a, a bit of a deeper dive through a panel discussion on entrepreneurship and innovation. So expect more to come for the whole week. Um, as part of this, 
throughout the week, we've tried to put at the forefront the researchers. We want you all to understand that there are folks who have been through this before and who have benefited. You're supported by a team of intellectual property professionals. I think you heard Glenn say at the outset, 85 years in aggregate of IP legal experience, uh, not to mention all the other experience that comes from the STPO side of the house. So you really do have a team who wants to see you succeed, who wants to check all those boxes, You know, benefit the nation, benefit DOE, benefit Argonne, and benefit you. So do keep that in mind. We're gonna try to give you a, a, another resource group, which is those scientists who have been through it. Um, if you take away three things from today, I want them to be, you know, first and foremost, there are opportunities here for you. Whether it's the 34% royalty sharing, whether it's TCF, LabCorp, Energy i -Corps now, uh, Lab to Market, there are opportunities out there, and we want you to take advantage of them. Uh, the second, again, there's a team of professionals here who uh, want to see you succeed, and don't be shy to reach out to us. Um, and third, and finally, spread the word. Uh, it's an IP week. We tried to break it out to allow those to come a la carte to those sessions that are interesting. But please pass the word along. Tell your friends and colleagues. Tell those that you're mentoring that this is important. They should be thinking about it. And it'll be a good time because there's pizza. Uh, so with that, I'm going to say thank you again to everybody who spoke. Thank you again to those who helped uh, put this on, all those who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to help you know, keep the trains running on time. And uh, everyone, thanks for coming.